No. That's okay. Yet. Cool. <laughs> what, what are you drinking? What I'm water? Drinking water in a, yeah. Ah, uh, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations lately about how we try to, we make a lot of fun drinks for our show, but also it just always comes down to water. Yeah. Cause I'm usually like, oh, I'm helping survive. Especially when we're talking. Uh, uh, oh, wait, Meg, come back. Yes. Come. What? I'm here. There you are. Oh, can you see you me? Weren't. Yes. Now I, can. I popped in and then I popped out. It's <laughs> okay. dramatic surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um Meg did you get anything fun over there in between I I did so Dr. Ferris we had someone that we interviewed right before you so I had a different drink for that mm -hmm. recording mm -hmm. it was very boring because I forgot what time we were recording and I was late to our own show so anyway <laughs> <laughs> here we are now I have my normal ginseng tea back nice. back we're uh we're doing my uh my adrenal support here because as our listeners know, I am a high energy, like crack level ADHD lady. So her <laughs> husband says that he can't turn her off without drugs. <laughs> oh, we have you know I envy, I envy you a little bit. I wish I was a really? little bit more like, I'm very much on like, I uh, vibrate definitely on a look like. I envy you. I would, I mean, I just, I need an off switch, man. Like we have a drug drawer over here now. My husband's got the CBD in there. He's got some, some weed edible stuff. And it's just like, I can't, I don't know. Melatonin's also in there. And <laughs> we call it our drug drawer. <laughs> I call it Meg's drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Another... Listen, we, we are past the full moon now, everybody. So I think we're okay. Oh, the energy is okay. coming down a little bit more. <laughs> Much safer territory. Much safer territory. <laughs> what are you drinking, Kylie? I've got Olipop. You know I have Olipop. Yes. Olipop. I, I love it. This tropical flavor is Brian's absolute favorite. Is it that new? I saw it your is. story. Yes. You, knew, you newly discovered it, right? This is not the new newest one. The one that you're talking about is the cream soda one, which I can only right. find in New York. It's a, they don't, I haven't seen it anywhere else. Oh, maybe very Dr. random places too. Yeah, very I, there's like a, yeah, there's like a random fruit and vegetable stand that I see. It. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just about it. Brian literally <laughs> said today. He said, "I'm going to send them an email and say why, why not? What's wrong with DC? Why are not? Why can't send it to me? Why can't I purchase it?" And I was like, "Well, I want to say that they're probably going to have a solid answer for you, but if you're genuinely curious, go ahead, send that email. Why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I'm for this email to Alipop. They need to know where their dedicated buyers are." They need yeah. to know. Even if it's just this one house in, in Washington, D.C., it's fine. We'll carry that's, it. We'll carry you guys. That's enough. Oh my <laughs> you, God. Guys, you guys, just the two of you alone, will support their entire there business. Their market, yeah. In D.C. <laughs> it's my most expensive habit. <laughs> that's not a bad one. That's no. not a bad one. No. It's no. not at all. And nope. that's not even like that much. It's not, it's not a reflection of the price of Olipop. It's a reflection of how much we purchase it. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, listeners. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my gosh. All right. Today, we have a treat. It is, yes, we bring a lot of dietitians on because, you know, those are our We people. love them. <laughs> and, yeah, we nailed it again this time. But not only a dietitian, although I think a previous dietitian. Yeah, I don't, I do not, I do no longer have my credential. But Okay, why don't you take over, actually? This is perfect segue. Oh, Go Lord. Ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Tell us who you are yeah, and sure. what you my do. Name, my name is Dr. Basma Ferris, and I am a former registered dietitian and current practicing OBGYN and culinary medicine specialist. And I, I am no longer, a people are like, yeah, she's a registered dietitian. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no, sorry. Um, no. When I was an intern, I didn't have time. It was like time for my re-credentialing and I was an intern mm. and I just didn't have time to do it. Um, yeah. And so that went by the wayside, sadly, because obviously I worked very hard um, towards oh, it. Definitely. When you're an the intern, you know, there's only so much time. Totally. Uh, there's only so much time in a day. So, um, no, the knowledge is still there. there. The knowledge it's is still, still there. there. Exactly. Yep. It's still there. <laughs> so 
I want to know first, how did you, what was the story for you going from a dietitian to an OBGYN? Because it's a specific one, right? That's not a leap that you hear a lot of people making. So what no, was it for you? No, it's not. And it wasn't, in, it wasn't what I intended either. So oh. um, I didn't intend to become a dietitian to then become a physician, number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um I just became a dietitian and then for various different reasons, which we could probably spend a whole <laughs> episode on, um, I decided to go to medical school. And my intention was to either become a gastroenterologist huh. or an endocrinologist, right? Because that's Very kind cool. of like, th that makes sense, right? Yes. Yeah. Nutrition to either totally. GI or, or endocrine. Mm -hmm. And that was my intent. And then, you know, when I got, when I actually got to it, a um, couple of things happened. A, I found I liked being in the operating room. Oh, I, didn't wow. love, I hated. I hated my surgery rotation, but that was more people. Um, oh, <laughs> than oh was, they didn't. Um, they didn't pass the vibe check. Is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were not my people. They were, they were definitely not my people. But I would hide in the OR. Like I would spend the whole oh. day in the OR, uh, and, mm. and I really enjoyed it. And then I had medicine second. So when you are um, like in your first and second years, med medical school, you try to plan your schedule so that you put the thing that you don't think you're going to like first or last, oh. right? Because you don't want to like, you want to make a good impression. So if you don't mm -hmm. really, like I wasn't interested in surgery, so I put that first so I could just sort of like get all my fuck ups out of the way, like <laughs> in the beginning. Yes. And I had medic medicine second. And that's like, you put medicine, like the thing that you do second usually is the thing that you want to do because now you're still interested. You're not burnt out, but you already had one rotation under your belt. And so you want to really shine. And so I did medicine mm. next and I was like, oh, no, this is, yo, this is not for me. I was really surprised and taken aback. Um, wow. For a couple of di different reasons. I thought, you know, that they were really going to... Um, appreciate my background and my knowledge i and would think the same and they yeah, didn't i guess at least, not where <laughs> I went, at least not where i went to school and that no. was kind of disappointing totally um, but this was a while ago and things certainly mm -hmm. have changed i think if i were doing things like now it would be a very different story mm -hmm. but probably if i was a dietitian now i probably would maybe be happier being a dietitian than i was back then because i think uh, the landscape yeah. has changed a lot totally um, and then, and then I did OB and I was like, oh, this is like just right. It was like the parts of surgery that I liked and the parts of medicine that I liked and um, the type of people I like to treat, um, yes. women. And, you know, and I really felt, and I would spend a ton of time in, in the OB clinic and the high-risk clinic talking to the gestational mm. diabetics. And, you know, I love delivering the babies. And I was like, damn, why is this what I like? Because being an OBGYN <laughs> is not easy. It's not known as no. being a lifestyle specialty at all. So I was right. like, I was kind of mad. I was like, shit, why is this what I like? But it was like, <laughs> but it, but it was, you know, like I really, that was what I was drawn to. Like I loved, I was excited to get up in the morning and go to the That's hospital amazing. early, yeah. early. And I'm not a morning person. And so the fact <laughs> that I was like, yes, I'm getting up. I go to the hospital. And I was wow. really excited about it. And I was like, oh gosh, I guess that's definitely what I have to do. But I was mm. really, I was like, why don't I like, you know, something else like neurology, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, so specialties kind of find you in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And I do love it. I do love what I do. And, yeah. um, but yeah, it's not the most sort of, you're not like, oh yeah, nutrition will be doing, although it, sh it should be standby. It should be yes. more of like a linear, totally. yes. um, right? Yep. But it's mm -hmm. not sadly. And mm -hmm. uh, for many different reasons, which I could also go into. But, um, <laughs> and we might, like it, we really might. Should, like it really, really should be. Um, totally. And I have a yeah. lot of sort of like you know, beef with, with sort of like the, the, the powers that be in, in, you know, right. in the OBGYN world about like why nutrition is not a bigger part yeah. of what we do and what we learn. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, right now mm -hmm. I, I think I'm a one woman crusade, but. Um, <laughs> You've got, you got two, two more. Right. You. Two more. <laughs> so I'm um, hopefully, you know, I've given grand rounds a couple of times about it and you know, and awesome. we'll talk about what my, you know, what some of my next um, steps are, you know, yes. a little bit later on. I can't wait so. to hear about that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, 
Ugh. That's the I, I love that. that. Sounded long winded, but that was the short. That was the short yeah, version. No, I enjoyed every second of it. I'm just so glad that we found you. Um, shout out to my former client. You know who you are if you're listening. I love you and thank you very much for putting um, oh, Dr. Awesome. Ferris on our radar. <laughs> but um, so we wanted to pick your brain today to have a very um, like factual and or straightforward conversation about hormonal birth control. And I think a lot of, I mean, it's, it's, I think we had talked about this before we started recording that we really want to take kind of the, Kylie, you said it really perfect. We want to try to take the emotions and maybe some of the political welfare out of the conversation, because we know how sensitive that is. And everybody, I mean, I just think it's important to point that out. Like we know that these things are influenced by that, but we really just want our listeners to be well-informed because I think yeah. there's a lot of confusion about um, potential side effects maybe of hormonal birth control or whether it should be the first option or not. And of course, that's, I think we're all on the same page when we come down to it. Like it is an individual choice, but the point is we want our listeners to be well-informed to be able to make that choice. So I'm really excited to ask you some questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, hundred percent. Um, it's a very, um, it's new, you know, it's definitely nuanced, right? There's so many different options out there, mm -hmm. but sadly we don't have great tools beyond our experience to guide choices. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't know that everybody is always educated or counseled into this is what to expect. This is right. normal. This isn't normal. And if you don't like it, we should try something else because it is yeah. a little bit of a, right. I can be like, ah, I think based on your characteristics and my experience, this one may be a good choice for you, but sometimes mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then we come back and we adjust. Right. And mm -hmm. so, um, it's always good to have that like pros cons discussion. Um, and not everybody does that. Yeah. And I, I am, would really love to hear what that looks like. So maybe that's a good place to start is if okay. do you, can you take us through what yeah, that conversation could sure. look like? Can I ask a backup question, a back yeah, totally tracked can. question first real quick. And I, some of my questions I think might be, first of all, genuine personal questions. Because <laughs> I actually, Mine don't too. Have any, <laughs> I don't have any experience with birth control at all. So for those of us who might be listening who don't, I mean, I think a lot of women hear birth control and generally speaking, we quote, know what that means. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually have a clue. What are the hormones? We're talking about hormonal birth control. So can yeah. you say, like, tell us what the hell does that mean? What yeah, is it? What question. are the hormones and what is the point that it's trying to do? And some of this, you guys, you might find helpful clues in listening to Jillian. I think it's episode seven on the menstrual oh, cycle. Yeah, Cause yeah. I think some of those terms are going to come up. So you might want to reference that at some point, but go ahead and share with us. Like sure. when somebody starts birth control, what are they actually doing? Yep. Totally. So I think when most people think about birth control, they think about combined oral contraception. That's the most sort of widespread used. And that's what, you know, what we call quote unquote, the pill, right? And so the pill or combined oral contraception is a combination of estradiol or ethanyl estradiol. So that's a, we as women make estradiol. So one of the estradiol estrogens our ovaries make. And then um, it's a synthetic form that has this other, um, the, the ethanyl group added to it. And that actually makes it a bit more, um, it actually increases the potency. So all combined hormonal birth control have ethanyl estradiol. That's the only estrogen that's used, at least in the United States. Okay. And then... It is combined with a progestin. Progestins are synthetic progesterone-like hormones. And the different pills differ in the type of progestin. There's many, many different progestins and the dose. So every combined hormonal contraception, contraceptive is going to have estradiol or ethanyl estradiol and 
a progestin. Mm -hmm. And so um, they have been, these different progestins have been formulated to try to address different side effects that people may have. Okay. Mm -hmm. From not having mm -hmm. actual progesterone being produced, right? Is what you're saying? Okay. So Mm -hmm. when somebody is on a combined hormonal contraceptive, they're given both the, it's, it's the combination of those two classes of hormones and it is doing several different things. Most formulations will suppress ovulation, but not all. Okay, because they're interfering with the pituitary cycling, right? Normally in the first half of our menstrual cycle, there's more estrogen. And then after ovulation, there's more progesterone. So this is in most cases in what we consider like in a monophasic pill, it's going to be the same dose every day for, you know, approximately three weeks. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And that is going to do a few things. It's going to suppress ovulation Mm -hmm. and it's going to... um, thicken the cervical mucus. So cervical mucus is that barrier in the cervix that um, changes during a normal menstrual cycle. It changes. And during the middle of the cycle in your fertile time, it becomes thinner. And I always Mm -hmm. like to call it the sperm superhighway. And so any progestin progestin-based contraceptives are going to thicken the cervical mucus and that's going to act as a physical barrier. So the ethanol estradiol is suppressing the ovulation if it's in high enough doses and then the progestin in it is thickening the cervical mucus and somewhat thinning the lining of the endometrium. So the endometrium is the sort of plush carpet that lines the endometrial (laughs) cavity Mm -hmm. And when it's plush, an embryo can implant. And when it's thin, it's not going to implant. So those are the Mm. different things that combined hormonal contraceptive is trying to accomplish. And that, and in those three sort of activities make it very effective to prevent pregnancy. Wow. So there, okay. Can I do a recap half for me and half for listeners? Okay. So every type of hormonal birth control has the same two components. They all have this version of estrogen that prevents ovulation. And then they all have varying levels and types of um, progesterone-like components Mm -hmm. that thickens the mucus and thins the wall. Yeah, the endometrial lining. Correct. Wow. So that's that goes for combined okay. oral contraceptives, the patch, mm-hmm. and the rings. So there's Nuva ring, mm-hmm. which is the mm-hmm. monthly ring, vaginal ring. And now there's a new one that's called Anovera, and that is actually a yearly ring that you oh. can, it's good for 13 menstrual cycles and you can take it out if you want to have a period or not because the period's wow. a fake period anyway. Like mm-hmm. the period that you have on oral contraceptives or any of these combined hormonal mm-hmm. contraceptives is not a real menstrual period. I think we need all. to pause by that because yeah. a lot okay. of people, I know this because I have like a 15 year history of being on hormonal birth control, but I talk to a lot of clients who have no idea that this is the case. So please. My mind is ahead. blown right now. <laughs> How do you have not a real menstrual cycle? Oh, what is the, yeah, tell me. I'm, okay. I am so, such a student right now. Most of the time I'm asking, <laughs> Asking these questions and I already know the answers. I have no idea what you're going to say. She's on the edge of her seat right now, Dr. Ferris. So. I literally, <laughs> the bench has ended. I'm on the edge. So and this is really important because people freak out. They're like, I'm not getting a period, but it's not a real period anyway. So it doesn't, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if you're on a combined hormonal contraceptive and don't get your period, because a normal menstrual period will be, you have the first half of the cycle, which is the, um, the follicular phase and the estrogen levels of are higher and they are fluffing up that endometrial lining, the, the fluffy plush carpet. Mm-hmm. And then after ovulation, progesterone, progesterone acts on the endometrial lining, gives it blood supply and nutrients and some mm-hmm. mucus glands. And that sort of is getting it ready for the pregnancy. And then when a pregnancy is not present, 
the levels of both progesterone and estrogen fall. And it's really the falling of the progesterone that allows the lining to come out and you have a menstrual period. So what is being simulated with the combined hormonal contraceptives if, is that you have estrogen and you have a progestin. And then in that last week, that placebo week of pills, there is none, right? There's no estrogen and there's no progestin. And so whatever is in the, endo, in, in the endometrial cavity comes out. But the longer you're on it, there's less and less material that builds up. Mm. And so it's, it's like, it's what we call a withdrawal bleed. It's not a real true menstrual cycle because you're not likely ovulating anyway. And so mm. if you bleed or if you don't bleed, it really does not matter. Mm. I see. It's okay, not so... building up. People think, well, where is it going? It's building up in my body. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not backing up somewhere. It's just not there. So the reason it's not a quote real menstrual cycle is because the whole first three weeks or rather last three weeks of it didn't actually happen. Yeah. Ovulation the... didn't happen. Exactly. So okay. it's not a real menstrual cycle anyway. And so that last week of like, I'm picturing a birth control packet, right? That's the placebo pills mm -hmm. stimulates that drop in both estrogen and progesterone that naturally normally happens. That Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't mean if you're okay. on the contraceptive, you don't, it, so some people decide to skip the placebo mm -hmm. pills or just kind of have a quarterly, you know, a quarterly bleed or, or whatever. And that's fine. It's all fine. It's all hmm. fine. Oh my God. That is so fascinating. Like I, I, I still like I think it's fascinating. Cards. I know. So, <laughs> and so, then, yes, yeah. go ahead. Well then, we, ahead. then, so that's just, that's combined hormonal contraceptives. Then we have right. a lot of progestin only contraceptives. Oh God. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I was going to I ask wondered you why that. you kept saying combined. I was like, yeah. is that what it's like? Well, some people, yeah, some people can't take estrogen for various different reasons. They have medical conditions that make taking the estrogen not safe. Um, either they have hypertension, they have a blood clotting disorder, um, they're lactating. Um, so there's various different reasons why taking an, an estrogen containing contraceptive is not appropriate. And for these people, a progestin only contraceptive may be appropriate. And there's many, many different options for that. So there's the, um, you know, if we go from like shortest acting to longest acting, the shortest acting is actually emergency contraceptive, right? AKA plan B. Um, and yeah, plan B is just basically a high dose progestin that's taken within, you know, 72 hours of, um, unprotected sex. And the goal of that is to delay ovulation. Um, and that, um, you know, that is an option that's out there for people if they're, if they're sort of primary contraceptive fails, whether that be condoms or, withdrawal method or oops, I forgot method or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, or just kidding. <laughs> I'm not ready method. Right. So there's many right. different reasons why that may happen. And then you have the progestin only pills of which there's two. Um, one is called the mini pill. It's, um, it's a progestin called norethindrone. And it's one that's commonly prescribed for people who are lactating because it's okay to take while lactating. And um, the, one of the cons is that it has a short half-life. So it really needs to be taken at the same time every day. And the dose cannot be missed. Whereas the combined ones, there's a little oh. bit more wiggle room. Um, with, the, with the mini pill, it has a really short half-life. So there really is not a lot of wiggle room. So it really has to be somebody who's going to like be uh, you know, religious about it. Mm. And then there's a newer pill that just came out, which has drospirinone, which, um, uh, Meg, you may have a lot of clients on because, um, it's the same progestin that is in Yaz and mm. Yaz is a mm -hmm. pill that has, um, a little bit of activity that overlaps with spironolactone, which is mm -hmm. an acne medication, right? Mm -hmm. And so some people will prefer to use um, either Yaz or the progestin-only version, which is just the drospirinone. The trade name is called Slind, I think. 
and um, I don't know who comes up with all these. Oh my <laughs> god! Like anyway, I said, but... no cards. Oh, god. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So there's that, and that one has a little bit longer half life than the other than the than the uh, the original progestin only pill, and then you have. Depo, which is probably my least favorite of all. It's I I, I say that that's the con. It's a it's a it's a injectable contraception mm. that's proge- only a progestin that's good for three months. I think I have in my in my last practice that I just um that I just left. I think I had one patient on it. Right. Mm. Um, it's really I think it's I I call it that's the option for people who just can't get their shit together. Right. <laughs> they, can't pills, they can't, they're like, I can't, I'm not, you know, they're all those people are like, I can't swallow pills and I can't remember. And literally they come and they get an injection, but there's a lot of side effects with it. Weight mm. gain, acne, irregular bleeding, prolonged mm. use can result in decrease in bone density. So it's really my mm. least favorite and least recommended contraception of all time. Mm. And then you have the um, Nexplan, which is a subdermal implant that goes in the arm. Mm-hmm. That's a progestin. That's a uh, three-year contraceptive. And then you have all the progestin containing intrauterine devices. Oh my so, gosh. So many different options out there. And um, they all like, they all have pros and cons, right? And so right. you really need to kind of tailor um, what works for one person. You know, the other person might, might totally hate and oftentimes mm-hmm. people just come and they say, yeah, I want to try this because my friend loves it and, mm-hmm. you know, or likes it or tolerates it or whatever. And then, you know, oftentimes it's like, oh, God, that's like, you know, but everybody's different. So for every person like, yeah, I want to try that because my friend loved it. And they come back and they're like, nope, not for me because <laughs> everybody's yeah. different. I was there. I've been on probably all of them, all of the pill versions. Right? And some people but... are like, yeah, I tolerated the ball and none of them bother me, right? They're those like magical people that just, they're like, meh, I didn't notice anything. Do you yeah. relate? So I, I have a question for you, Dr. Ferris, and it's yeah. it's purely from my personal experience. So I'm huh? hoping that you can shed some light on it too, because I know that there are so many people out there like who have had similar experiences as mm-hmm. me. And I just felt like, Honestly, my experience with hormonal birth control for that long, I was on it for 15 years. Yeah. And I, I kept going to my doctors and saying like, I just don't feel good on this. Mm-hmm. Like I just, yeah. and, and, and they did like, we did some of the experimenting that you had mentioned. I was on Yaz and then went to Yasmin and went did like, you know, I did the whole thing and I eventually found a pill that wasn't as bad. It didn't feel as bad for me, which is good. Yeah. So it was doable, but like, I started thinking about why, I mean, do you, in your practice, do you also see clients who come to you who are just kind of like, I just don't feel good on this yeah. pill. And yes. so my question for you is, what do you do for those patients? What do you say to them? And is there, can you explain to us some of the reasons why we may yeah. not feel? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, some people start it in their teen years and they're just on it for 10, 15 years and they're happy with it and they don't feel any <laughs> that would be right? There are some people that try things and they're just like, I just don't feel right. I just don't feel like myself. And yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, some, what I see often, certain progestins tend to be really more negative when it comes to mood. Mm. Okay. So people who have worsening of their depression or anxiety on certain progestins. So Mm -hmm. um, some people note different physical changes, right? Changes in their weight, changes in their breasts, breast Mm -hmm. tenderness. Some people have breakthrough bleeding. Some Mm -hmm. people, many people have a decrease in their sex drive. Decreased Um, libido, big one. Because mm -hmm. being on oral contraceptive increases circulating levels of sex hormone binding globulin, which might be good for some people, but that can then decrease free levels of estrogen and testosterone. Mm. And so people complain about having decreased sex drive. Vaginal dryness, almost to the point of um, being like perimenopausal or menopausal. So sometimes I've You know, I'm like, we can either try something different. We can either increase the estrogen in your pill or take you off the pill completely or add vaginal estrogen. So there's different ways of addressing all these different side effects. But what it comes down to is really taking, getting the assessment of like, 
what are you trying to accomplish with your contraceptive, right? Are you on contraceptive solely for pregnancy prevention? If so, let's have a whole conversation about the full spectrum of your options, right? Maybe the pill is not for you anymore. Maybe we need to try something else. Maybe you go off it completely and see what your body does. And maybe you realize I, I feel the same and that we actually are barking up the wrong tree, right? Mm. Maybe an IUD is suitable. Maybe like, so let's have a conversation about what are your goals with this pill. Some people tell me, no, I went on it because I had really painful periods. Well, then that mm. may be a reason to stay on it because it can be really effective for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have really heavy bleeding, right? And so that's a, like an appropriate reason to use it. So I think first, so those, so what are the, what are the potential side effects, right? What do you think you're, what are you experiencing mm -hmm. that may be attributable? Cause it may be, and it may not be, and we can't, we'll never know until we test, right? Until we test it. And the really, mm -hmm. you can't do a blood test to test for that, but mm -hmm. you can actually stop it and see what happens mm -hmm. um, or change it or adjust the dose. Um, sometimes the same pill may be available in like the same combination in a different dose. So mm -hmm. there's all of these different things that we can try to get you to hate your contraceptive. Look. Some people love their contraceptive. I was like you. I had hellacious endometriosis, yeah. really bad endometriosis. Wow. And I, I hated being on the pill. But when I mm -hmm. understood why I needed to be on it, I hated it mm -hmm. less. Because oh. I understood there was a gain, right? There was mm. a gain for me in terms of reducing the, pro like preventing progression and improvement mm. in my symptoms. So it made my sort of like emotional negative feelings towards it less so, right? Mm. So there's mm. always has to be, but I, so, and then I had to, like you, try a different until I found one that I didn't hate so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. that makes sense. So, so I yes, yeah, so I I get it. I get it a hundred percent. And so those are the conversations that I have, right? Mm. Sometimes, okay, maybe it's not for you. Maybe we can try something else. What are we trying mm -hmm. to accomplish? How long do you feel that you need to be contracepting? Like, what are your reproductive goals? All these things. I would have much preferred your answer versus the answers that I got <laughs> over the years. <laughs> like the, but, the no, the well, you know what. The gaslighting, right? I mean, it is, I, I hate yeah. to use that term, right? Yeah. But what but I want- But that's how I felt. Yeah. That's how you felt, but you want to know yeah. why, right? Mm -hmm. We, as physicians, we're also gaslighted, right? Right, when yes. When we buy, buy, buy all the companies that, um, yeah. it's not like we're lying and being like, oh no. no, the studies say that, no, that's not, that's not a side effect. And no, that's not, this is the information that we're given, right? Whoa. So, you know- when I, when I first was practicing, I'd be like, no, progestin containing IUDs do not cause any of these side effects. And then patients come back and they're like, a hundred percent, this happened to me after I got this, you know? And it's mm. like, you can't tell somebody that they're not experiencing something that they're experiencing. Right. But the information that we're given is also not always the best information. Right. That I can totally in. see that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate knowing that. Yeah. Like wow. think about, yeah. you know, I, let's see, I train, I, you know, I, I was in college in the nineties. So that's when I was first learning nutrition and how things have changed. It's yes. Not like, <laughs> right? It's not like how I was counseling my patients back then was mm -hmm. be, it was because of the information that was available at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like I was trying to give people. No the or wrong advice. information or relaying the information in a way that maybe was not so useful. Cause I think that's more, that's, that's a lot of it, right? How do we counsel? It's not like yes. the factual information. It's like, how do we actually talk to people? Um, totally. Oh, wait, that brings me to another, another side story, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. It's about the information that we right that we are, are, are given and what, and we're doing our best to try to get that across to people. Totally. So, and we've talked about this too, that there's just like a lack of time in a lot of oh, conventional practices. Yeah, so it's probably just not even feasible for many. Again, like we know it's not a malicious thing. It's just, it's the system and it sucks. <laughs> it really it's fucking sucks. And it sucks. And it's like, yeah. um, you know, my, I, I have a few, um, my partners who would always 
have all of their charts closed at the end of the day. And I was never that person because I was always talking too much, always talking too much, <laughs> always spending too much time talking to my patients. And at the end of the day, you know, then I have to go back and, and chart. And you know what? It's not the best habit, but at mm-hmm. the same time, I'd rather like spend the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Being that a real human good. being. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask you quickly, aside from, and you mentioned a couple of these, but aside from wanting to prevent pregnancy, what are some of the other reasons that people come to you wanting to be on birth control? Um, yeah. you know, especially in like teen years where I assume that's probably not, well, I don't know. I shouldn't assume. Tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the teen years, especially, I would say people come from menstrual cycle regulation because it's not unusual for people for their first couple of years, first few years of their reproductive life to have irregular cycles. And that could be a nuisance if you're an active young person, you're in sports, like you just don't feel like getting your period randomly in the middle of the day, unprepared, right? Mm-hmm. Pain. Um like bad PMS, right? Some people really have terrible PMS and that can be disruptive. Um, Menstrual migraines, heavy bleeding, painful bleeding, and acne is an indication. Um, And PCOS, which is a whole nother like can of worms (laughs) to open and, and it has its place in PCOS but it's not the only it's not the only thing that people with PCOS need but it does have its place. Mhm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now gosh, what is the next question? I have a question if you want. Okay, go ahead. Can... Yes. <laughs> I I have so I have, many. I know I have so many questions, but what I what I want to know is there and I, I don't know I think I've seen maybe some studies, but I don't actually know if they're even studies now that I'm thinking about it. Just information floating around there somewhere about nutrient deficiency, or sorry, nutrient depletion and long-term hormonal birth control. So I would love to hear your perspective on, is this something we should be worried about or not, not, maybe it's not even, maybe it's a minuscule amount, if anything, and maybe it's not even a concern, but I'm just curious about what your position on it is and what you what you think? Yeah, it's interesting. Cause it, it's not been well studied, right? So mm-hmm. as so many things in the overlap of nutrition and women's health, right? Mm-hmm. Two underfunded areas of study, which yes. makes sort of like what I want to do, you know, very difficult at times. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, just, I think there have been sort of, sort of anecdotal or not great studies um, mm-hmm. associating contraceptive use with B vitamin deficiencies. I can't mm-hmm. exactly really think of what the mechanism would be for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of the, some of the criticism of those studies is that, you know, they were looking at a younger population who maybe just weren't great healthy eaters. And so mm-hmm. they, they were mm-hmm. just deficient because they had other sort mm-hmm. of co-founding habits. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, whether somebody's on contraceptives or not, they should be eating a good, healthy diet with lots of nutrient dense foods and adequate, um, adequate, you know, essential fats, good, healthy fats, important Mm. for hormone production. And and Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so I'm not entirely sure of like the, like the mechanistic ways Mm -hmm. in which that would be true. I think the point that I heard too, though, is that like, again, you make a great point about that being an area of research that's underfunded and we just kind of don't really have an answer at the moment, but is there, are there things, I think you had started to allude to this too, that um, are there things people should be doing to support their bodies? I I think, I mean, it sounds like it's kind of in general, (laughs) whether they're on hormonal birth control or not, but because this conversation is centered around hormonal birth control, is that are there nutritional things perhaps that people should be aware of that they should be doing to support their bodies? Always right. Doing things that protects your liver. Great point. Right. So making sure that you're not eating a lot of, um, 
refined carbohydrates that may contribute to fatty liver disease, right? Because all of these hormones are then conjugated in the liver and then excreted. And so making sure that your liver is healthy, getting, like I said, a set good, you know, healthy fats so that you have adequate hormone production, um, you know, not drinking too much alcohol, um, all the things that you're, you know, that you would want to be doing to protect your liver so that it does do what its job and excreting, you know, the excess that you don't need. Mm. And that's also our liver processes, everything, including hormonal birth control metabolites or when we have it. So that's would also be another reason for that. I'm assuming just correct. Make sure it's yeah. being used properly. Okay. Adequate fiber so that it can mm. conjugate the, the bile acids and, it, you know, so you can excrete the the conjugated bile acids, et cetera. So get rid of all the shit, know, all the, I think is what you're saying. Shit. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, so what, okay. I feel like I have a really good understanding of what the hormonal birth control and its various options are, what the point is, why somebody might come in to use it. And if it's not working, what some of the options might be. So yeah. if it's not working, I have a couple questions here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what might that look like? And what are some of those things or what we were talking about, the cons in general of birth control that maybe aren't always outwardly shared until somebody comes in and they're all freaked out because they're already experiencing something? What's some of that side of this conversation? Sure. Um, so changes in skin, depending on which, um, progestin, some of them are more what we call androgenic. So that may cause some more, you know, untoward side effects, acne, facial hair, um, weight changes minimal, but maybe in the form of, um, water retention, Okay. Um, may, may be legit weight gain, not usually in, in large amounts, but you know, enough to maybe bother somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, the mood changes we already discussed, right? Changes in mood, um, changes the first few months, almost always, um, there's some irregular bleeding. So people need to know that from the get go. Otherwise they stop it and they come back and like, it's a whole thing. Um, the, the risk of, of blood clots. So whenever somebody starts on an estrogen containing contraception, we have to counsel them that if they have swelling of one of their extremities, that's sudden, they need to stop taking it and go to the emergency room. People shouldn't smoke if they're on contraceptives for that reason. Mm. Um, what else? We've talked about the chain, the decrease in libido. Some people experience vaginal dryness with prolonged contraceptive use. Um, so those are, I mean, those are most of them. Con- changes in bowel function, mm. right? So if their progestin is like a higher dose, they could have some like progestin slow everything down. So they may experience some um, constipation. That's fascinating. So that also maybe could be where the, the fiber would come in too. Then would that also help maybe mitigate, uh, mitigate well, some always, of that? I'm a fiber pusher. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Gotta love our fun. I think all of us are, Kylie, yeah. obviously, <laughs> with the work that you do too. So that's good to know. Did you have other, there were more parts to your question, right, Kylie? Well, just to follow that up, I'm wondering what about people who, Meg, you know, you might be one of the people who have been on uh, birth control for decades and now yeah. they're ready. Uh, they do want to have a baby. They have to come off of it. What yeah. does that whole experience or what can that look like? And what are some of the things that people maybe need to be mindful of or that you might say if they're feeling freaked out because their period might be all over the place? I'm pulling from some like friend stories right now. So, yeah. <laughs> so certainly when people go off, oftentimes they just cycle right away and they get pregnant right away, right? So some people go off prematurely thinking because they had a friend whose period didn't come back right away or it took a little bit of time. They go off prematurely and get pregnant before they want to. So I see that sometimes. Mm. So don't go off until you're ready to get pregnant. Mm. 
start taking, if you're not somebody that takes um, folic acid, make sure you're taking folic acid at least three months prior to stopping your contraceptives. Is that for pregnancy pre for prep pregnancy. or? That's okay. for pregnancy prep. Okay. Um, because if you're going off contraception because you're ready to have a baby, that's one of the things that we want you to do amongst other things. And then making mm -hmm. sure that you're not on other medications that may be mm -hmm. a, a contraindication. Um, some people may not get their menstrual cycle right away. If they've been on oral contraceptive for a decade, um, mm -hmm. if that lasts for longer than six months, that warrants a, an evaluation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's something that is a, it, it just happens and it comes back, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but um, there's de medications that we can try to just sort of flip the switch, right? Mm. Get your, it's the HPA axis just has been quieted for so long. It just needs to be mm. turned back on. Is that what Not, it is? It's been kind of suppressed, suppressed. for so long. It mm. doesn't remember, so to speak, that it needs or has a job to do. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot okay. of sense. So can I interrupt for a second and ask, uh -huh. like, what is this post pill PCOS business? And is it a thing? That, yeah, your that's a tricky one. I've, I've read a lot <laughs> about it. And I haven't and I'm still I, I don't know. Yeah, because I've done some things that like, support. Yeah, maybe this is a thing. But then, mm -hmm. you know, when you take the histories of some people, maybe they actually already had PCOS, right. like if you really mm -hmm. get a good history, what was going on before you went on the pill that nobody mm -hmm. actually ever asked you about? Like, what was your reasoning for going? Did you go on the pill because you're, right. you know, because of acne or because of an irregular menstrual cycle? Because mm -hmm. if that's the case, then, um, you know, maybe it was present all along. Um, mm -hmm. And so, or maybe there really is truly an effect because it gets disrupted and there's maybe, you know, like that's the that's kind of like the signal that disrupts the cycle. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I can't answer that. It's a tricky one. It, they're it both totally one. reasonable. I mean, it makes total it's probably, sense. That, I mean, it's probably a mix, right? Yeah. It's probably, mm -hmm. it's probably a mix. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, I think I interrupted though. What, um, <laughs> I, I had to ask about post-pill, I mean, post-pill PCOS. Ooh, that's a tongue twister. That one is hard. Um, so what, what is the, what are one of the medications or some of them that people can, if let's say they come off the pill, six months goes by, they still don't have a cycle. What does that process look like? So, um, what, so if they don't get a cycle, that's called amenorrhea, right? So you want to know why, right? right? So mm -hmm. typically what I'll do is I'll check a thyroid level, right? Check a TSH and the full thyroid profile because thyroid disorder is a very common in rep reproductive age um, mm -hmm. people. And then do it like do a PCOS workup, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a PCOS? And then mm -hmm. if not, um, we do what's called a, like a progesterone uh, challenge. Okay. And basically what that mm. does is, is by using progesterone for 10 days, you're going to do a couple of things. If somebody takes progesterone for 10 days and after they stop it, they bleed. That means their ovaries are making enough estrogen to fluff up the lining so that there's actually something to come out. Okay. okay. So it's a test. Okay. Hmm. It's number one, it's a test, but there's something about the progesterone that um, may actually resensitize the either the pituitary gland or the ovary to get things cycling again. Got you. Wow. So, so is it's this a have... test and potentially a treatment. So what I'll do wow. is like, great, tell me if you bled, fabulous. And then in a month, let me know what happens again in a month. Because the first bleed mm. is not going to be a real period. This right. it's really what's telling is the following month what happens. So mm. sometimes that's all it takes. Interesting. Wow. So is this um, a specific dosage I would imagine that they would need? This isn't something where you could like slap on a progesterone cream or something for 10 no, days. No, no progesterone <laughs> cream for 10 days. You need, you need, yeah, you need either Provera or progesterone. I prefer progesterone. Mm. Um, but either, you know, either one is fine and um, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple. 
That's fascinating. Is yeah. there mm-hmm. anything nutritionally that you would recommend for somebody who's having like coming off the pill, amenorrhea? I would assess a couple of things because you want to kind of get a sense of people's like just composition. I see a lot of um, women who are on the lower end of the weight spectrum or lower end of the BMI spectrum Mm -hmm. or lower end of the body fat percentage spectrum. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's because their body fat percentage is too low to support Mm -hmm ovulation and so Mm. it's counseling to try to increase that which can be very challenging and people can be very resistant Mm -hmm. as you might imagine Mm -hmm. um but yeah so slightly increasing body fat percent with you know in a healthy way Mm -hmm. um and seeing if that does the trick so we're talking like added calories, but through extra healthy fats and all the good stuff that you said, fiber and all that stuff. That's your Correct. preferred method to do that. Cool. Yep. Fascinating. Anything else? And if, if not, I'm sure that's the, sounded like that was like the first nugget of golden nugget. Is yeah, what that's I was trying sort to say. of the, <laughs> I mean, it kind of depends where people are in their sort of journey, right? Some mm, people yes. are super impatient and they're like, I need, I want to be pregnant yesterday. Right. So then I just, refer them to my friends, the reproductive endocrinologists. Some people are willing to take the time to just work on improved health, improved sleep, improved lifestyle, all the things. So it really depends on where people are in their journey. That's a really, really great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody kind of arrives there slightly, slightly um, differently, I suppose. Differently. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I, I also just want to say to shout out and I'm just I'm saying this because this is how I feel personally. But if there's anybody else listening who maybe wants to go off birth control or is thinking about it and you're and it's not because you want to get pregnant, it's just because maybe you don't want to be on it or don't want to take a pill every day. That is me as well. And I feel like it sounds like these things would also be beneficial for them to maybe minus the folic acid, it sounds like, which is why I asked if that's what that was for. <laughs> oh, that's a really, that was, that's a really good point. I, it's such an interesting and nuanced conversation because it's not about just wanting to get pregnant or avoiding pregnancy anymore, which is why this conversation is so important. It's because so important. People just get mm-hmm. birth control left and right now. And it's not, it's fine. It's like, it's like getting a multivitamin anymore. And I, I, I think that this kind of conversation and really understanding what you're doing and what it's doing to your body so that Mm -hmm. if you then are not having a positive experience, you have some sort of framework to kind of follow in order to ask the right types of questions. And I Mm -hmm. think from my friend's experiences and even Meg for you, when you don't know what you don't know, which is the point of what we're doing here, Mm -hmm. you, you then don't have a lifeline to be able to ask the question or even know what question to ask. And that's where I think people really have an experience of being truly disserviced because you should have access to the stuff, but then when it doesn't give you the result that you're looking for and there's a million options, you're really like, you go in circles for years as you both seem to have experienced. So (laughs) I'm hoping that you guys, I'm hoping this conversation is hitting for some of you and giving you a little bit of a roadmap to, to follow if you are in any of these positions now or later and, and Mm. share this episode with a friend that you know might be struggling because I think what you're telling us is that there's a ton of different options and there's a lot of different reasons why something may or may not be working. And if you have the patience and like the bandwidth, (laughs) something can be found or a different type of workup can be explored because there may be a problem, I think is what you're saying. There could be something going on. There could Mm be. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if we exclude all the things, you know, sometimes we don't find things and that's probably the most frustrating, right? Uh, Because we don't know everything. mm -hmm. and, 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 And so I get that that's super frustrating for people. Yeah, but no, you're absolutely right. So you need to find somebody who you really can talk to and and who is patient to be willing to come back and discuss 
these, you know, what your options are and what might be going on and what to expect and what's normal and what, you know, like, what are you willing to tolerate, et cetera, what your goals are. These are mm-hmm. all the important conversations that need to be had beyond just like, I need something. Um, right. And also that if you, the other the flip side of that is if something works for somebody, even though it doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean, right? Or let me say that in the reverse. If something doesn't work for you, it doesn't make you feel well, but it works for somebody else. Well, good for them, right? Don't right. shame them. Like I see a lot of mm. that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that's fair and that people should be, because we're all different. Our biology is all different. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, like one is not, one is not better than the other. Totally. I have one final question for you. Um, is there- Are you sure? No, I already <laughs> thought of another as I was saying this, but I'm going to try to stick to one. I Thank you for seeing me and knowing already. I do, that all the t- I do that all the time. I'm like, can I ask you one more question? And I'm like, fine. I'm fine. like looking at the time. I'm like, how fast can I talk about the question? <laughs> oh, 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 did you get that? <laughs> is, there, is there anything, um, I want to say this in a way that's not going to be um, is there any concern about not getting a true, now that we've established true menstrual cycle versus just kind of bleeding, is there anything concerning about not getting that for any X period of time? None that I can think of. Okay. Um, that actually decreases your risk of endometrial cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, so all forms of any, any, uh, hormonal contraceptive actually decreases your risk of endometrial cancer because there's less growth of the endometrial lining. Mm. Um, and then most, uh, most hormonal contraceptives actually also decrease your risk of ovarian cancer. Mm. Um, so I can't really think of any reason why, like any harm that I know of or have ever come across of having a like, just sort of like thin, inactive endometrial lining. Hmm. I genuinely just not, that not I know sure of what the answer was. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. right. I did have another question. And this <laughs> one will be the last one. Um, for the person who might be newly thinking about birth control, they're going into their doctor's office. Here I go. What <laughs> is the top one, two, three sort of questions that you want them to come into that appointment armed with to Ooh, ask good question. in order to get the right information to get at least the best starting point for themselves. So question number one is, what are my options? What are my contraceptive options? Right? Keep it open because then your doctor really should take you through just the same way I did, like A to Z from like, you know, fingers crossed to sterilization, right? The whole spectrum of contraception. Right. And everything in between. That's the conversation that should be had. And if they can't have it with you, they should have some sort of resource to be like, here, read this and then come Mm. back with your questions. If you don't have the time, at least have some sort of resource. Okay, that's a great idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the second question should be, is there anything about me, the patient, right? that you think like should steer me towards one versus the other. Because if you walk in there, right. And you want to know, like, how do you pick? Yeah. I'm I'm asking these questions as if I were to go in and get birth control, I would have no idea what the Mm -hmm. choices were why they were different and what and how to ask somebody to explain yeah what this is a great this is perfect what is it about me that's making you suggest this particular one i want to know right so is that something that you want that you recommend people say okay well if x is your recommendation can you explain to me why yeah is that a fair question to ask a fair question, maybe like, oh, well, based on your, you know, your medical history or based on this or based on that, I think this would be a good, right? This is a better choice for you. Uh, or, or it may be like, you're one of those people that has no zero contraindications and it's really just a personal preference. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And I, I'm, I really love what you said earlier. Sometimes I'm wrong and we have to change it. And I think mm-hmm. that should be a nice reminder to people that, you know, the person on the other side of this conversation is just the same as you. It's a, it's a person, it's just a human being. And yeah, you know, they know and the we're choices. A team. Yes, we're a team. Mm-hmm. So that, and, and we're, you know, so we're doing this together. I like, mm-hmm. I'm a big, big fan of IUDs, big fan of IUDs. I put a lot of them in and, mm-hmm. um, but they're not for ever. Like some people just really have a terrible, terrible time with the insertion or some people that, just that really would be me. don't, <laughs> don't oh, tolerate it well. Most people do amazing with it, but so many people come in with like, they hear the horror stories. And mm-hmm. so there's a conversation around, you know, what all of, you know, why it might be appropriate for somebody and, and not for somebody I couldn't else. even handle um, a colposcopy. So an inserting an ID would not, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> so there's a different, yeah. So, you know, that's the whole, right. That's, that's all part of it, right? Yeah. You may mm-hmm. expect this, but then if you expect, like, if you're still having this beyond a certain time frame, right. So mm-hmm. like, you know, be like, oh, doctor, well, you said I may have this side effect. Is that going to be for the entire time I use this contraceptive? Mm. Or is this just for like getting started? Because that's an important question. Because to know what to expect in the first several months really is going to make or break your success with it. So if you Mm. know, yeah, I may be nauseous for like when I, because, oh, that's something. When you need but he first starts taking oral contraceptive, the estrogen can make you nauseous. Mm. So, right. So that's kind of a hump to go, to get over, but it's, it shouldn't last. So it shouldn't last beyond several weeks or a couple of months. So if you know that mm. up front, then you know that that's normal and you're not gonna, you'd be like, well, can you give me something for the nausea or what can I do for mm. the nausea? Like mm. I want to be, I want to continue to use this if possible. How can we get over this hump? Mm-hmm. right that is terrific if I have like irregular spotting how long is gonna, that gonna last is that mm-hmm. normal and mm-hmm. like I can I can handle that and let's get over that hump and then mm-hmm. you know it's gonna be great after that so having so, somebody to help manage the expectations so they can mm-hmm. kind of like help set you up for success so you're not freaking out about something and kind of yeah. ditch it before you really had an opportunity to see if it was successful. Which is what I did the first time I went on the pill. Uh, My doctor yeah. didn't tell me that I was going to have all thing. kinds of crazy, weird bleeding. And I stopped it. Yeah. And then I bled more. And she was like, well, mm-hmm. why did you stop it? I'm like, well, you didn't tell me. And nobody yeah. answered me when I called the office. So yeah. mm-hmm. I just stopped it. So that was see, my the, experience. Yeah. And so that's mm-hmm. why I try to sort of just yes. keep crushing. Cut it like, off the past. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is exactly why I asked because I think a lot of people, you know, it's such, so commonly available for people now that it really is, there's not a lot of thought to it anymore um, from the experiences that people have shared with me. And I think just these simple questions to know, wait a minute, it might not just be black and white for me. Mm-hmm. What else might it look like? And having somebody explain that. Okay. Yeah. Those are terrific yes. gems for people to go into an appointment. Or maybe it's not even new. Maybe you're experiencing some of these things that you were talking about and you want to know how to ask questions about it. Like that's mm-hmm. very empowering to understand how to gather more information, I think is such a barrier that we, f- we face in medical stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Faris. I am Ah, so, so grateful that you spent time with us today. And so we want to know before we go, where can people find you and share with us? You have a new program that you're you're launching. It's in in the baby stages, but people can find me on Instagram. I just changed my handle. It's now Dr. Besma Faris. So it's easier to find. Um, And um, I'm launch, and I have a website smithfarris.com cool and i also have a new venture that i am that's in its baby stages it is so exciting holly prep p-o-l-l-y-p-r-e-p and the name comes from it's the idea is is that it's a prep school for people with pcos and I, I love that. Oh it's my God. All about education because I have a habit of saying to my patients if I didn't teach you something about your body today in your visit, then I haven't done my job. 
So mm. education goes so far. And as mm. you can tell, I really like, it's, it's really where my heart lies. And yeah. So the program is going to be, there are going to be some self-study modules and then there are going to be um, some instructional portions. Uh, I'm not going to give it all away, but um, <laughs> right. yeah, it's going to basically, it's going to be a niche uh, medical practice, um, all telemedicine to start with me for people with PCOS oh, so to cool. come and get educated and treated, but more education than anything else. And so I'm really excited about it. Um, so just sort of keep, there is uh, yeah. Holly Prep is the handle. So if you want to go ahead and follow me on Instagram. So when it does come live, you will all be in the know. And um, yeah, so super, super excited about it. This is really where um, I like to say that PCOS is where like the two halves of my brain come together, the gynecologist and the nutritionist. Yeah, um, I can see that so, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I really find that I have um, just a point of view to offer to um, definitely to people with PCOS with the goal in mind of just like just lifelong management, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lifelong just health and wellness, not managing because really what happens now is people with PCOS go to see a bunch of different doctors to manage mm -hmm. each of their symptoms. Yeah. And nobody is really driving the bus. Mm -hmm. The patient is obviously the person is, but they don't know all that they need to know. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the education um, on like how to really help yourself, you know, through, through the lifespan and what to expect with PCOS. So I'm really excited about it. Um, oh. I am and too. I'm excited. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's, it's, so yeah, it's going to be like a prep school. Although I've never been to prep school. I am public, public school educated through and through. So it's like prep school through like my imagination. But yeah, um, yeah it's just, um, it's going to be fun. And um, it's going, I hope it's really going to, you know, be helpful for a lot of people. And when I'm telling is, you, teaching you people just like you did today. There's nothing more empowering or powerful for a person. Getting treated is one thing and it's important, but to teach somebody how to maintain that so that they don't have to depend on somebody else, new level. I, this is yeah. amazing. I'm so grateful that there are people like you existing in this space because it is as we talked about, under-researched, under-appreciated, under-talked about. That's why we have this podcast. That's why yeah. we do this. Yeah. yeah. One clarification. Is the poly prep P-O-L-L-Y or P-O-L? Well, how did you spell it? Two L's. Like the That's girl Polly. Yeah. Cute. And the yeah, handle is P-O-L-L-Y P-C-O-S. P-R-E-P. No, P-O-L-L-Y. Oh, oh, sorry. Right. Poly prep. prep. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, okay, <laughs> got it. So all that will be in the show notes for our listeners. Go follow Dr. Farris, go check out all the stuff that she has to offer. And I think we should have you back for a round two of PCOS because we did a, a like a sure. very general episode, but like if you're willing, we definitely want to have 100%. Have you come this back. was super <laughs> fun. Megan Kylie, you two are a blast. <laughs> you really are. Thank We're you. We're so glad. Thank you. Thank so you we'll for being here. Yes, yeah, so, so we'll bring you back for, for me. stay tuned for round two awesome. of PCOS. <laughs> Bye, Dr. Thank Ferris. Thank you, Dr. Ferris. Bye. Bye.